So welcome back, everyone. Coffee break is over. Thank you. So welcome to the second part of uh, Threshold Cryptography. We have two amazing talks in this session. The first one is Snowblind, a threshold blind signature scheme in pairing free groups by Elizabeth Kreitz, Chelsea Komolo, Mary Mella, Stefano Tesauro, and Chen Zi Zhu. And Chen Zi will give the talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, today I'm going to present the Snowblind of threshold blind signatures in pairing free groups. So, let's start by recalling what, our blind, uh, what blind signatures are. So, a blind signature scheme is a protocol between a user and, and, uh, and an issuer. So the issuer holds the secret key and the user can interact with the issuer to obtain a signature uh, for their message, which can be efficiently verified uh, using the public key. And in addition, we require that the user, uh, sorry, the issuer doesn't know the message during the interaction. And moreover, we require that even given the message and the signature later, the issuer cannot link them back to which interaction that issues them. We call this property blindness. Um, there are many applications of blind signatures. They were first proposed to construct an um, anonymous eCash system, and they are now used in several system industries, such as privacy pass, Apple uh, private click management, and Google One's Rebian services. So, however, our concern here is a uh, risk of secret key compromise. And the normal way to, um, to, solve, uh, to mitigate the risk is by uh, thresholdize the protocol. Um, so therefore, in this work, we we'll study a threshold version of line signatures. So in this scenario, a secret key is a secret shared among a group of issuers. And um, to obtain a signature, the user needs to uh, interact with at least a threshold T of issuers. And the blindness guarantees that even if all issuers are glued, they cannot link uh, the interactions to the message signature pair. And in terms of unforgeability, roughly we require that a malicious user cannot forge um, extra signatures after several uh, signing interactions, and even if it glues with T minus one corrupted issuers. I will give a more formal definition later. Uh, so for blind signatures, there are schemes based on uh, pairing on RSA and on pairing-free groups. And uh, both pairing-based schemes and RSA-based schemes have threshold versions. But for schemes in pairing-free groups, there is no good construction yet. So there are constructions, uh, but they don't have, uh, there's some constructions, but they don't have the desired security uh, guarantees we want to achieve, and we will discuss that in a minute. So the main focus uh, of this paper is on the schemes based on comparing free groups, and they have the advantages that they, uh, they are supported by standard libraries, which is not the case for pairing-based schemes, and uh, they have smaller signature size compared to RSA-based schemes for achieving the same security parameter. So in short, um, we're addressing the following questions. Can we construct uh, efficient threshold blind signatures in pairing free groups? And we provide positive answer in this paper. So ideally we want to start from um, uh, blind signature schemes in pairing free groups, and then um, provide a threshold version of it. 
So therefore, I would like to give an overview of what is available. So it worth noting that uh, all the pre previous constructions, including our results, are proven secure in the random Oracle and the algebraic group model. Uh, removing any of the uh, idea models with the uh, heavy cryptos is a challenging open problem. So in early 1990s, um, a blind, uh, the blind Schnorr signatures uh, were proposed, and they are very simple and efficient. However, a recent our attack shows that they are not concurrently secure, um, which is uh, a fatal drawback for practical use. And therefore, um, efforts have been made to develop uh, an uh, efficient schemes that are concurrently secure. And the current state of art is my previous work with Tesoro, which uh, is almost as efficient uh, as flying snore and concurrently secure under this real log assumption. And other, other schemes are either less efficient or they uh, rely on some non-standard assumption. And in terms of threshold blind, it was scheme, uh, there were only some efforts to try to thresholdize a variant of blind snore called Okamoto snore. Um, but these schemes inherit the same problem as a blind snore uh, that they do not provide concurrent security. Um, so given the past literature, um, so we are trying to thresholdize the Pesaro Drew scheme in this work. So, and our contribution are as follows. So we first show that uh, the server drew scheme can be uh, improved without uh, compromising security. More precisely, we show that we can reduce the signature size by one scalar. And in addition, we also give an alternative construction with a simpler security proof. And then we show a threshold version of the improved schemes. And these are the first threshold blind signatures and parameter groups with concurrent security. So for the rest of talk, um, um, uh, I will show um, our constructions and convey uh, some main ideas without going to proof details. So first, let's um, have a closer look at uh, unforgeability of blind and threshold blind signatures. So unlike a normal signature, where the unforgeability is defined as uh, you cannot, uh, the adversary cannot forge a signature that is not being issued by the issuer. For blind signatures, um, it is unclear what signatures are issued. So therefore, we need to use another notion called one more unforgeability. So a security game is defined as follows. So um, the adversary plays the role of a malicious user. And it can uh, uh, interact with the honest uh, issuers for uh, L concurrent sessions. And the goal is to output L plus one valid distinct message signature pairs. And here the concurrent means that the user don't need to wait until the previous sessions is finished before starting a new one. And to extend one more forgeability to threshold blind signature, the first difference is that adversary now can corrupt the T minus one issuers. Um, for example, here you can corrupt the second issuer and learns a secret key. And also you can interact with multiple honest issuers in a single sign round. And similar to blind signatures, the adversary can engage in um, error concurrent in synchronous uh, signing sessions and the goal is to output L plus one distinct message and signature pair. So here it was noticing that the, uh, all the signing sessions are arbitrarily concurrent and asynchronous, which means that the adversary uh, don't need to wait until all issuers respond in one session, sorry, in one round before sending out message for the next round. So the first part of our, uh, so for the first part of our result, um, or briefly goes through the prior construction and then see how we make improvements. So the starting point is the blind, uh, sorry, is the signature schemes. 
uh, uh, proposed in the early 90s. So it's fairly simple. So the secret key is just a random scalar, and the public key is a G to the secret key. And assign a message, the first sample a random scalar A, and compute the nouns as G to the A. And then we compute the challenge at hash of the nouns and the message. And then we compute the Z as A plus C times secret key. And then the final signature is a noun and a Z. And to verify a signature, we first recover the C from the nouns and the message, and then check whether G to the Z is equal to the nouns times public key to the power of C. So intuitively, the signature is hard uh, to forge because the Z is hard to compute without knowing the secret key. And the uh, blind Schnorr signature uh, basically runs the signing protocol of Schnorr signatures in an interactive way. And in addition, there is a randomized procedure uh, run by the user to blind the signature. So here I will not uh, give details of the randomization, but the key uh, property that I uh, ensure is that the signature is independent of the interaction. So that which implies the scheme is perfectly blind. And surprisingly, the recent work by Suhamoda uh, et al. Uh, gives an attack, a so-called RS attack, which breaks one more forgeability of blind snore uh, in polynomial time. And more precisely, the attack um, um, as, uh, executes just log p signing sessions in a clever way that allows the adversary to force one plus log p signatures. You know, uh, roughly speaking, so the attacks crucially leverage the linearity of the protocol. So namely, uh, it attempts to linear linearly combine two signing sessions, uh, let's say the Z1, A1, C1, and Z3, A2, C2. And to get a signing session for uh, Z1 plus C2, A1 plus A2, and C1 plus C2. And this, of course, is not given uh, give you a signature in general, but the RS attack carefully leverage the concurrency to uh, make ensure this is the case. So that the Sorojou scheme um, uh, bypass this issue by introduce a new random value y that randomize the c when computing the z. And this y is sampled already in the first round. And the issuer creates a commitment um, to, to the random value y and send it to the user. And then this challenge now is computed by also hashing the commitment. And in addition, uh, the issuer will send the opening uh, of this commit to the user in this final round. And then the blinded openings are then added to the signature. And the signature will satisfy these two equations. And due to the C and Y terms here, we cannot linearly combine two sessions anymore. And also, and moreover, we can, uh, so the schemes uh, are proven uh, on one more affordable uh, on the discrete log assumptions in the random oracle and algebraic model. And the first contribution of this work is that we show we can reduce the signature size um, without compromising security. So our main observation here is that we can combine the commitment and announce. So now the challenge is computed as the hash of the commitment times announced and the message. And then we verify the signature instead of these two equations. We just need to verify the single combined equation. And then so the signature size is then reduced by one, by one scalar. So another contribution is that we're asking ourselves whether um, 
um, as I said, whether like it's uh, it's like the only way to blind is C is by multiplication. So that is whether we can find another way to do this while another function that's of the C and the commuted random value Y. And it turns out we can instantiate F in another way, which is the C plus Y to the power of Q. For Q, that is co prime to P minus one. And for most elliptic curves, we can set Q equal to five. As a therefore, our uh, optimized schemes look as follows. So here, the uh, randomized procedure actually different for different instantiations. And in terms of security, we show that both instantiations are perfectly blind, and also uh, uh, one more forgeable under the one uh, of the under the D log assumption. In particular, in the first instantiation, we um, we we do the similar reduction as the prior work and get the same security bound. And for this, and for the second instantiation, uh, we give a simpler security proof, where we reduce the one more uh, unforgeability to the one-dimensional ROS problem, which is known to be information theoretically hard. And for the last part, I will show how to specialize our blind signatures. So let's start with a straw man scheme. So first, uh, secret, uh, the secret key shares uh, are just the T out of an Shamir secret share. And then during signing, the each um, issue I will sample its own uh, nouns, uh, AI and the commitment BI for the value YI. And after the user receives all uh, um, all the commitments and uh, uh, and announce it computes A as a product of the AI and B as product of BI. And then the user like view it as the first one message for the underlying blind signatures. So, and then the user runs the user protocol for the underlying blind signatures to compute the challenge C. And then the user needs, uh, the issuer needs to compute the VI. And the natural way to compute it is as the AI plus the F of C and Y times the uh, lambda times the secret key. So here's the Y is the sum of all the YI, and the lambda is a Lagrange coefficient. So here, uh, the problem is that the issuer doesn't know the Y right now. So um, a straightforward way to solve it is we just let the issuer send y right back to the user and let the user compute the sum and send, send y back. And now the issuer can compute the di and then um, each issuer send the di and vi to the user. After receiving all the di and vi, the user computes d as the sum of di and v as the sum of vi and then use the uh, use the protocol of the underlying blind signatures to compute the final signature. So one can show that the one more for the sorry the perfect blindness of the Roman scheme is implied by the perfect blindness of the underlying blind signature. But unfortunately, we cannot show the one more forgeability of this Roman scheme. And I will try to explain the main issue and how and and how we fix them. So the first issue is that we need to make sure the y that's sent by the user is always equal to the sum of yi. And this is not guaranteed by the Strawman scheme because the user can send any y. And the idea to fix it is we let each issuer compute the y itself and use a commitment to ensure the correctness. So completely in the second move, we let the user to also send back all the commitment they received. And then the issuer was opening, we send opens of the commitment to the user. And after receive all the opening, 
user across them back to each to each issuer. And then the issuer can check the correctness of each yi, and then it can compute the sum of the y by itself. And then oh, when we try to prove the one more forgeability of this scheme, uh, unfortunately, we have another issue is that we need to extract the yi from the vi in the second move for all the corrupted j. And the solution we do that is we include another online extractable community. And then we get a final scheme, a snow blind. Um, so things we're in the random oracle model. Uh, so here we just, I, here we just use the hash of the yi as an online extractable commitment to the wire. So in terms of security, we show the snow blind is perfect blind and one more forgeable under the this real log assumption. So finally, I'd like to mention a few open problems. So first, um, it was interesting to know whether we can construct more efficient schemes. So for example, to improve the wrong complexity of snow blind, or removing the actual commitments. And also, um, uh, our result is proved, uh, only proved the static security of, of a, a snow blind. So it would be interesting to know whether we can extend our result to the realm of adaptive security. So, and that's it for the talk. Yeah, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Also from the people online. Uh, thank you for the talk. So I have a question about the um, applicability of the scheme toward anonymous credentials. So can you turn it into an anonymous credential with say attributes? Like one one time use anonymous credential, like our scheme, right? So I see. Um, you mean for the blind signatures part? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. can you can you take this blind like for example, our scheme has these nice yeah, yeah, properties, and you can turn it into an yeah, anonymous credential. Yeah, I think for our but... scheme, there's um. Mm, Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think uh, for AC light paper, they actually use some other properties like you, you have an actual generators where you hash the message somehow. But so I'm not sure whether you can directly like uh, transfer our scheme into the AC light paper. Okay, I see. Yeah, so it, it does, it has like some of the the things that make it raw secure break the algebraic properties that you need. Um, um, I think, yeah, I think the property we need, like, is, um, is also about blindness. So although we did not talk about it, but you have to make sure that the function you use is, uh, it can be blind. Okay. So that's not always the case for the, like, for general function. It might be hard. To... Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. If there are no more questions, then let's thank the speaker again and let the next speakers get ready. Yeah. Oh, so the next and last talk of this uh, session is practical to know threshold signatures without the AGM by he and Chu, Paul Gerhard, Tim Roffing, and myself. And uh, he and Paul will split the talk where Paul will start. Thank you. Yesterday, we saw a great talk of um, Elizabeth talking about the security of Sparkle, which is a three-wound Schnorr threshold protocol. 
Our talk is somewhat related to this talk as we want to talk about the security of Frost. And, ah, okay, perfect. Especially we want to talk about the security of Frost 3. As we have seen last, uh, yesterday in the history, um, the versions of Frost have somewhat evolved. Um, where Frost 3 is the latest version that was proposed at CCS 2022. Our, the journey of our paper started when we looked at the security proof of Frost and we saw that there was quite heavy machinery going on. Though for assumption wise, there was an AGM, idealized TKGs, the random oracle model and the one module log assumption. And we thought about if it would be possible to remove some of these assumptions and still um, claim Frost to be unforgeable. The first assumption we looked at was the random oracle model and we thought, okay, Frost is based on the ROM, so let's stick to the ROM. The second assumption we looked at was the algebraic ROM model log assumption. And actually that's an interesting question if we still can remove it, however, we didn't do it. But we looked further in the AGM and we found out we can build a security proof without the AGM. Then we looked at, at idealized EKGs and we even saw, okay, we don't need idealized EKGs to prove the security of first three. To do so without having an exponential loss, we invented a novel proof technique, which we refer to as mixed forking. In the remaining talk, I will talk about FOS3, the P dozen DKG and the assumptions. And after me, the end will take care of the mixed forking technique. Actually, I wanted to give you like an introduction of threshold signatures so that we are all on the same page, but I think we are. So let's make it really quick. If we talk about threshold signatures, we have like a set of n signers and whenever t out of n of these signers want to sign a message m, they can exchange partial signatures. And the good thing is that we don't need each n of these, but we can just use t out of n signers and get an ordinary signature. By ordinary, I mean the signature verifies in the same manner than the um, signature scheme would verify when it's not thresholdized. So it's nice because we can replace um, the signatures by a threshold signatures and verifiers won't notice. But let us start from the very beginning. Um, our journey starts at Frost, um, which was proposed by Komlo and Goldberg back in 2022, where Frost stands for a flexible round optimized Schnorr threshold signature scheme. It's currently standardized by the IITF and there are multiple implementations going on. And most importantly, it can be proven secure in the dishonest priority set, but I will talk about this later. Uh, to give you a little overview over Frost, especially Frost 3, um, Frost consists about uh, of two of two rounds. The first round is a pre-processing round, which is run without if you know even the message. And the second round is a signing round, where you have to know the message. Let's dive a bit deeper into these rounds. So I first talk about pre-processing and afterwards it's signing. So when two parties, uh, the example is for two parties, want to make pre-processing, um, each party is computing a value D and a value E, which are like random values. They are committing to these values by raising a group element to the G or to the element, and they are exchanging afterwards these commitments. After the commitments have been exchanged, um, the parties can aggregate these shares. And this is the main difference between Frost 3 and Frost 2, because in Frost 2, this aggregation was like trivial, and in Frost 3, this aggregation is yeah like the multiplication of these group elements. The second round is a signing round. And the signing round looks pretty much like the ordinary Schnorr signature scheme. And I only show you like a simplified version of it. So you get the gist, but you don't get confused by details. The first thing we see here is the computation of the random element R equals to D times E to the B. Again, this prevents the birthday attacks or the Ross attacks. Um, so we don't have these, so we are concurrently secure. Afterwards, we are computing um, this z out of a hash function, and then we finishing with Lagrange interpolation and like and the normal schnorr. After the parties have exchanged these values, they can aggregate the signature by again computing this random commitment and just adding up the signatures. If you look at here, this r value is like d plus b times e. And if we look at the final signature that comes off after aggregation, we see indeed it's like R plus C times X, like a normal Schnorr signature. When we look at the history of proving Schnorr secure, there are like three different versions, but actually they are four, but let me tell you more about it. The first version of FOST1 was proposed as I already said by Komlo and Goldberg. It was the first round optimized Schnorr threshold signature scheme, and it was proven secure based on a non-standard heuristic argument. Afterwards, there have been like two concurrent works, the first one by Kreitz, Komlo, and Meller, and the second one by Bellare, Tessaro, and Zoom. 
referred to them as ROS2, and the first one is ROS2KCM, CKM, and the second one is PTZ. The main difference between ROS2 and ROS1 is that they save exponentiations in the signing protocol. Um, the first version, CKM, was proven secure using the random oracle model, the von Modilog assumption, and the Schnorr knowledge of exponent assumptions, which is proven secure on the AGM. The second version was proven secure using ROM, von Modilog, and idealized DKGs. Afterwards, Frost ROM came across. It was proven by Ruffing, Ronge, Jin, Schneiderbench, and Schröder. And the main difference between Frost 2 and Frost 3 is that they now are aggregating the protocol message in the preprocessing stage. However, the proof focused more on robustness than on affordability. So as we have this overview now, we can see we have these four assumptions I told, about, I told you about, and now we want to talk about each of these assumptions. The first assumption I want to talk about are idealized CKGs. So as I said, when we want to um, prove uh, threshold signatures, we first have to exchange keys, and afterwards we can sign corresponding to these keys. But ideally, we don't like to think about the key generation algorithm first. So what we are doing is we're using an um, idealized EKGs, and then we only can prove the security of the signing without taking care of the EKG. And if the signature scheme is indeed secure, we can use a fully simulatable DKG, and the combination is still secure. However, the problem is that the most um, that we don't know if there's a simulatable DKG in the dishonest minority setting. As I said, frost can be proven secure in this setting. And secondly, people in practice like Peterson DKG, but Peterson DKG is not simulatable, and the simulatable DKGs are not as efficient as the Peters DKG. So we have a little difference between practice and theory because practice people really like Peters. But what is Peterson? We already heard about Peterson like two talks ago, but as a quick recap, Peterson is basically n times verifiable secret sharing of Feldman, where each user computes like a polynomial where the zero component is the hidden value, and then the joint protocol computes the sum of these protocols. In the end, the secret key is f of zero, and the share of each user is the evaluation of the protocol at the point i. To make it verifiable, you have to add some commitments, and this POP, POP which stands for proof of possession, is basically a Schnorr signature on the secret value here. It's good for us because it's an additive secret sharing of the secret key, and we can use all these properties of Schnorr signatures and the bad thing with the Peters and EKG is that it's not fully simulatable um, due to a possible shift that Gennaro et al. pointed out. And that's somewhat interesting now. So we have a DKG everyone likes to use, but this DKG is not as secure as it needed to be for being used with idealized DKGs. But still, in the end, we can prove the security of the combination of this DKG that is somewhat weaker and more efficient together with um, Frost 3. The next assumption I want to talk about is algebraic group model. It's an idealized model where each where the adversary gets as input group elements, and he can output each group element he likes, as long as he can explain how it came to this group element. Where explaining means the user has to give like the um, linear combination of the group elements he already knows, and this combination reaches to this group element. The problem is, in general, we don't want to use idealized assumptions because we want to use as less assumptions as possible. And there are two works, one of um, Katz et al. and one of Mark Sentry, that claims that there might be problems if you use the AGM in security proof. The last assumption I want to talk about is the A or MDL assumption, where A stands for algebraic and OMDL is basically the one more DLOG assumption. Um, the AOMDL assumption is a falsifiable version of the OMDL assumption, where falsifiable means that there exists an algorithm that is efficient that can check if an algorithm breaks the OMDL assumption. Why isn't the OMDL assumption um, algebraic? The problem here is this DLOG oracle, because in the normal OMDL assumption, it's not possible to simulate this oracle efficiently. But if you have like this explanation of the group element you want the DLOG for, it's actually possible with this equation. And it's uh, important to notice that the AOMDL assumption does not refer to the AGM, because in the AGM, our adversary has to be algebraic, but in the AOMDL assumption, only the reduction has, because only our reduction called this DLOG oracle, though this adversary can output like normal group elements. 
And in the end, when you play against the AOMDL assumption, you win if you can output as uh, if you can output more DLOG values, then you call the DLOG oracle. Up. Unfortunately, we don't have music because actually I wanted like the the frozen music for right now. <laughs> but no, we're going from Frost to Olaf. And um, where Olaf stands for maybe one last Frost, but you're not sure. And to get Olaf, we first took Frost 3, which is the most efficient Frost version. Afterwards, we used a simplified PDS and DKG. It's simplified not only because we focus on forgeability. So we basically stripped off everything that does not belong to unforgeability, but we still believe our result holds to the um, ordinary repeaters and DKG. And in the end, we didn't want to use the AGM or idealized DKGs. So we get up with full Olaf. <laughs> but now let us talk about the security of Olaf, but this is what Ian will do. Thank you, Paul. So I will take the second half of the talk. Thank you, Dominic, for introducing us. So. For the security, okay. So now we are on set. For the second half, I'm going to show you how we achieve our goal by proving the security security of the OLAP scheme. So exactly, first of all, let me go over the enforceability model that we are using. So you can see the similarity of our model with the threshold enforceability zero of uh, Bele, Tesoro, and Chu at last year crypto. And this is the zero. So an adversary in our case can corrupt up to the threshold minus one parties. Sure, in a chosen message attack, it should have the ability to make signing queries. And because we consider the DKG on top, the adversary can also make the queries for uh, interacting with honest party during DKG. Just one important notice, that in our model, we consider a strict separation between the two phases, which means that an honest party only accepts signing queries after it thinks that the DKG had been done for it. In the end, the adversary is called to win if it outputs a valid falsary on a challenge message that never queried before. So this is a normal unforceability winning, but not the strong one. And we basically proved that forcing OLAP is at least as hard as breaking AOMDL assumption. I think Paul already showed you about the assumption. I just want to make a remark that not only the adversary need to solve all the challenge, it's important that the number of delog queries in the end is strictly less than the number of challenges. This is quite basic. You can say, but somehow in proof, this can be tricky. And if you're not careful, or you cannot up about the number of delog queries in that sense, this might kill the correctness of your proof. So we are ready for our proof strategy, but first let me consider a simpler setting where we have single signer. So our reduction have control on our Foxer and it has query access to challenge and distribute Oracle. 
Firstly, it's ask one challenge as a public key, forward it to the forger. To simulate signing queries for the forger, like to produce valid signature R and Z on a query message name, it's used exactly one challenge and one discrete block query. In the, in the end, when I output the forgery, it's used a forking argument to extract the script key small x, that is exactly the, the last solution of the public key. It can easily compute the, the, the deluxe solution to other channels. Let's consider our important condition. It's just counting the number of deluxe queries with exactly number of signing. And the number of channels is one more. OK, perfect. So the strategy for a single signer seems to work well. When we look into the literature, we'll see that single signer setting is somehow well studied, maybe because simulation of signing is simpler. And although it's rely on forking techniques, those techniques also well studied um, by Pachi Van Storm, Bella Nevin, and the tiniest is sure to be optimal. But we will we onset with single signer. So we'll see when we leave it to threshold, what will happen. There are some challenges that some techniques just not directly carry over. For example, instead of using just one nonce big R, like some previous slide, we use two nonce because we need to answer maybe the same, maybe the two signing queries for the same challenge in both executions of the by fork of the two branch fork. And this is um, essentially how Frost or any two route threshold snore scheme are doing. It's not something new, but uh, just keep in mind that because of uh, the requirement of the proof, they need to make this modification to the desired of the scheme to have two nonces. And second, because we have Peterson DKG or some simplified DKG on top, this is an additive key sharing. So the DLOG challenge will be embedded, um, maybe not directly to the Choi public key, but will be embedded to some uh, signing key share. So it means that in the end, the reduction not only need to extract the charge zero key x, but also need to know the component, the signing key share xi, in order to solve a computer solution for AOMDL. So before moving forward, just let me again make a remark that because the limit of the number of the law queries, we only have enough those queries to simulate to executions of signing. So now we are really into the proof strategy. So we are using Peters and DKG together with some provable sessions, let's say in Critest, Comlo, and Manla. Uh, let's say it means that each signer after DKG will also output a proof PI showing the possession of uh, some signing key share XI for it all as corresponding to some public key share like G to the XI. And later in the proof, we will propose to you a novel forking proof technique that will help us to extract those XI value from PI. So you may ask whether you need new forking lemma or technique. How about the other existing approach in the literature? So that's why we make a review here for the existing approach. Let's say, we have Bella Niven bifurking with this famous square of uh, probability loss. And we also even have another form of the forking lemma, which is called the like, Zendi challenge directly multi forking lemma. We have some special design and some, some nice features. That is, it can be used for multiple extraction. And for each forking point, it can keep trying many executions until it reach a second successful branch. 
and then it ignore all of the fail executions. So you can see that the fail execution on, only appear on the right side, but not on the left. Putting them together on the table, we easily compare and see the good and the bad. So for by forking, easy to see that it's more efficient, just two executions. And our AOMD approved will like this. But uh, on the bad side, it's not so perfect for multiple extraction. For example, you want to make it uh, compose it in T time, you will lose like two to the C in the probability. But on the other side, the multi forking by uh, BCJ can handle multiple extraction points with the payoff that the running time is in polynomial because it needs to rewind polynomial time of executions to be succeed. So putting them to the context of problem proving OLAF, we'll see that it's somehow each of them some of the part of some of the part of our problem. So let's see, the bifurking can be good for extracting the fosteries in the signing phase because of the, the requirement for two executions during signing. And the BCJ forking lemma will be better for extracting the signing key shares from the POPs during uh, the DKG. You will see that neither of them solves the problem completely. So because on the left-hand side, we only use the bifurking exponential loss. We only use BGJ forking, okay, too many executions, and in the end, wasting too many deadlock berries. So somehow we need a new approach to leverage both the, the advantages of both the approach. That's why we're coming up with an attempt that called two-step approach. That is almost what we call the mixed forking in our paper. So let's say I'm re re representing our adversary, our foster as a straight line for his house stream. It's going through DKG and then go through signing. And the DKG forking point it is uh, represented by the red timber, and the signing forking point is represented by the blue triangle one. So for the first step, we apply the by forking on top of the foxer to extract the secret key from the fossery. And on the outer layer, we apply the BCJ forking lemma on top of C to extract the signing key shares from the POPs. This composition is natural. And you can see that in the end, our adversary D already have enough information to, to solve the, the DL challenge. But there's still a but. As you may already figure out. So C or only run two execution of A, which is so nice. But when D run on top of it, it run polynomial time many execution of, of C. So as a result, D also run polynomial execution of A. All of them will require to go to signing. And this is bad because what I said, we only have enough the log queries for only two executions of signing. So this is what we do as solution for this issue. That is, we pronounce many executions at the right time. And the right time is right after the DKG already complete, which means that POPs are output. So you see that essentially we modify D into D prime where it only let two execution of A to go through signing. And these two executions is enough to extract uh, the falsary.
but all of the others, we cut them off right after the EKG because at that time we already have the POPs. So that's enough to extract the signing key share from the POPs. And what me it means that whatever D can com then compute, D prime can also output, can also compute. But D prime successfully solved A on DL while D cannot. So this completely solves our problem. And so our proof go into our goal. So, so to make a conclusion that we already proved the possibility of OLAF, that is combination of FROST3 together with simplified Peterson DKG and POPs in AOMDL and random model Commodore. The probability, yeah, you look as good as in single sign-on setting, um, but we also um, witness a grow in running time, this poly time in expectation. If you want to know more about the detail, details of the proof, please go to our ePrints version that already uploaded. It. And if you care about robustness, design, and possibility, please check the paper rows. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks for the talk. We have time for maybe one short question. If there are no questions, then let's uh, thank the speakers again. And please join us in the invited talk of Scott Aronson.